Excellence. We are live on Facebook. <laughs> Hello out there, book lovers everywhere. Uh, I'm Amanda with Warwick's. Julie is doing her civic duty today and is at jury duty. Um, so that's why you've got me, her understudy. Um, but it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. I get to introduce two wonderful authors while we wait for Facebook to catch up with the real world and set on, send out the notifications. I will say a little bit about Warwick's for those who perhaps don't know our bookstore. Uh, we are located in La Jolla, California, which is a little north of San Diego proper. Uh, we, our tagline is since 1896. So we are celebrating 125 years of uh, being a bookstore uh, in different, different spaces, but we've been in the same space in La Jolla since the 50s. Um, we are the oldest continuously family owned and operated bookstore in the US. So not the oldest, but the oldest that has stayed in the same family. Um, we were we started in Minnesota, a great state for bookstores, eventually made its way across the country. And Nancy Warwick, our owner, is the fourth generation um, owner of the store. Mm -hmm. So we have endured because of book lovers like you who continue following us and purchasing books from your local independent and supporting both us and authors like these wonderful authors tonight. Uh, we shut down for a few weeks last year, but we're now up and running again, normal hours of operation, curbside pickup for those who enjoy that, a strong virtual events program as evidenced by events like this. So again, we thank everyone for supporting us and uh, you can come into the store if that is your want. And we have not only books, but an exceptionally curated uh, selection of office supplies, art supplies, wonderful, unique things you can't find anywhere else in our gifts and jewelry departments, leather, um, an amazing assortment of fine pens, everything you need for the holidays and beyond. And uh, so with that, please do consider purchasing tonight's book from us. Uh, I will put the link in the comments on Facebook and you can follow that link and have it come right to your door, super easy. So with that, I am going to hit record and recording is in progress. So this event will live on in perpetuity on YouTube as well as Facebook. So I will introduce our authors for tonight. Uh, Warwick's is very pleased to host Denise Hines as she discusses the new paperback edition of her book, The Brief and True Report of Temperance Flowerdew, in conversation with Elizabeth Cox. Denise Hines is a former literature professor and a PhD graduate of Duke University. She writes fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. She is author of a scholarly work on Toni Morrison and the satirical eco-thriller, Sally St. John's, which I personally wanna hear about later. Um, a descendant of Louisa May Alcott, she lives in North Carolina and she will be joined in conversation with Elizabeth Cobbs. Elizabeth Cobbs is a prize-winning historian, novelist, and documentary filmmaker. She's the author of eight books, including American Empire and The Hello Girls, and the New York Times bestseller, The Hamilton Affair. Her most recent book is The Tubman Command, which we did host her for in store uh, in the before times, and it was a great event. And that's a novel based on the Civil War military service of Harriet Tubman. Cobbs previously served on the State Department's Historical Advisory Committee and jury for the Pulitzer Prize. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Jerusalem Times, and Reuters. And she has produced two historical documentaries for public television. A Stanford PhD, Cobbs holds the Melbourne Glasscock Chair in American History at Texas A&M. Uh, before I leave the screen, please do remember, please put your comments and questions in the Facebook comments. Um, 
I will watch those questions as this discussion unfolds and I'll come back in after their discussion to bring your questions in. And so without further ado, Warwick's welcomes Denise Hines in conversation with Elizabeth Cobbs. Well, thank you, Amanda. I'm gonna kick it off because I am the chair and the uh, organizer, well, not the organizer, facilitator, but I just wanna say, Denise, that I'm gonna put this up here since I'm not sure when it's gonna come up on Facebook, but I, you, we were supposed to have this conversation, as you know, what, six months ago? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the, you know, the usual technical difficulties. But I really, in a kind of weird way, it's nice for me because I got, I had to reread the book, <laughs> it's been, you know, months and months. And it's really, it's a beautiful book and it's very, very interesting. So, you know, maybe you could just like give a one sentence thing because people don't know, they may not know why they're turning into this particular talk. And, and I'd like to just ask you how you got going on it. Why this? I mean, I, you live in North Carolina, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's sort of near, but not near. So what got you going on it? Right. Uh, born and raised in Michigan, but found my way to North Carolina. Uh, but um, I wanted to thank Warwick's for hosting this event. And uh, Elizabeth, I can't thank you enough. Uh, this was this blew up a few months ago and you were gracious enough to, and Warwick's was gracious enough to give it another go. So here we are finally. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I love history and um, ever since I was a little girl and uh, I think that anytime I um, discover something interesting about the past, uh, I have to learn more about it. And um, that's exactly what happened with this book. I was watching a documentary on the History Channel about Jamestown, the, the, the period known as the starving time. And it was so fascinating that I just, after I watched it, I had to do some additional research. And that led me to Temperance Flower Dew, whom I never heard of, even though I taught early American literature uh, while I was a professor. And shortly after that, um, there was an article about a recent archeological dig at Jamestown that unearthed the remains of um, a teenage skeleton, a girl. And I knew in that series of events, that not only did I find something that was fascinating to me, I had to write about it so I could tell other people. And, um, you know, I mean, th there's always a longing, I think a lot of us to be able to go back to the past and how do you do that? It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an impossibility at least now. And so one of the ways I've retreated to the past as best I could was through my imagination. Uh, and so research is one thing, historical record is another, um, but your ability to fill in those gaps and to imagine yourself in that space is what gets me writing. Did you find, did you go back to Jamestown? I mean, after you heard about this skeleton being dug up, did you feel like you had to go there? Yeah, uh, that was really an amazing experience uh, because they have the original Jamestown site and then next to it, they have the reconstruction. I didn't go into the reconstruction because I had already started to write the novel and I just thought if I got it wrong, I don't want to know that. <laughs> so um, I went to the original site and then they also have a museum with a bunch of artifacts, including skeletal remains of the original, some of the original Jamestown residents who had been dug up. And they had also done a facial reconstruction of that, that girl who was dug up couple of years ago. So you could actually see her face um, as it probably would have looked back then. Uh, so that was really an amazing experience. Yeah, no, I, I you know, of course, I, I don't want to give away anything. Because you know, one of the neat things about your book, I think, is that you really managed to create that sort of tension, that sense of how many mortal hazards these people face, right? I mean, I remember one early character, maybe it was, you know, temper, Temperance herself, her, her father dies from a toothache. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, if this doesn't get you, that's going to get you. you know? <laughs> so like, it's just this sort of, but without your ever making it feel like, um, I don't know, like it's, it's a lot of doom and gloom, but it's not like that. It's just so interesting how people manage to survive and how they kind of claw their way forward. I, I, you know, I thought you handled that really well. You know, I, I write historical fiction too. And, and one of the things I was curious about 
if you wrestled with or not, because it's something I wrestle with, which is how do you avoid kind of anachronism? You know what I mean? In other words, we had certain values today about how women should act, for example. And sometimes characters will go, well, why didn't she stand up for herself? Or, you know, something like that. You know? so right. did, did you feel like you had to work around that or think about that at all? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because when we insert ourselves into history and try to reimagine it, we are in that in anachronism by virtue of us just trying to, to occupy that space. And so, we, you know, you're, as you say, you're always on guard um, to not commit that sort of uh, uh, time chronological sin. Uh, but um, I don't know, I, I guess resorting to dictionaries and, and going back to the history and uh, just trying to reflect on how much my experience has started to color the narrative uh, just to try to keep myself honest. And, uh, how do you handle it? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, uh, when I was writing my first novel, I was arguing with my daughter who wanted the, my heroine to be, I think of this because she wanted my heroine to like be more spoken, stand up for herself. I'm like, they didn't do that. Or, you know, premarital sex, they didn't do that, or at least not commonly. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's one of these things I think you just, you know, you can't just fall whim to, as you said, to yourself or to popular taste, but I also thought that you handled it kind of deftly. At one point in the novel, you talk about, um, you kind of show how how temperance, this, whose name I think is craziness. I mean, like <laughs> temperance flower do. I mean, who, who would ask great, it's, that's, that's almost Dickensian. You know how Charles Dickens always made up those names that fit the, fit the person. Um, and it was wonderful because I didn't even have to make that up. No, I know that one just <laughs> handed you on a platter. Uh, <laughs> but I thought, for example, at one point you talk about, you say, uh, God did not intend for the weaker sex to write. So it's this interesting thing where your character is conscious that, you know, sex roles prohibit her from doing X, Y, or Z. And yet she is also kind of flouting the convention, you know, in a conventional way which mm -hmm. I think is maybe how you get around anachronism, I'm right? People had to survive. Like she's trying to figure out when, when these men are kind of stupidly ignoring obvious problems, how does she talk to them about that and still, you know, still be a polite woman. And it's kind yeah. of, it's an interesting tangle. I thought, I thought that you handled that very well. And um, I think it happened probably more than we realized. It's just to make its way into the historical record. Uh, and I remember teaching The Awakening by Kate Chopin, and my students were always irate that she made the decision that she made. I hope I'm not spoiling the ending for anybody, but she, you know, she pretty much jumps into the sea and kills herself. And, they, and students don't understand why she didn't have any other options. So that was always in the back of my mind when I was writing is that sort of pushback we have against this fate that was in many ways predetermined for these women that we wish had not been the case. Right, and, and at the same time, you know, I thought, thought you also did a good job of showing, I mean, men were stuck too, right? I mean, they're, and class is a really big part of your book, <clears throat> naturally enough. <Right. laughs> I, I teach like you, um, I teach early American history, not mostly, but sometimes. And, you know, I always think this, the classic story about Jamestown is that it, it had too many aristocrats, right? <laughs> Yeah, guys who were like, well, where's my servant? <laughs> ding, mm -hmm. ding, 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 ding. And, and like, wait, they, you didn't bring those guys or there's, you know, five of them and 20 of you. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Was that something you had to think much about? I mean, how did that work into your telling the story? Well, I think what helped was uh, the, the find uh, at the archaeological dig of the skeletal remains, which were found in a compost post pile off the kitchen. And now you're thinking you're not going to find the, gen, the the gentile or nobility or the upper class in a compost pile off the kitchen. I wouldn't think that's got to be somebody who came from the lower classes, perhaps was a servant. Uh, so that really kind of shifted the my perspective. Um, and that's such a beautiful and and poignant detail. Denise, I mean, because I, I do think that that's what we do as writers, <clears throat> almost especially when you're doing historical fiction, is you're looking back at stuff and going, how do you make sense of that, right? That the body would be in a compost heap. And right, right. 
And that says volumes right there, right? That's right. The, the guy who, you know, had a cross and you know, was buried in the churchyard. I, I wrote a, um, a novel about Alexander Hamilton and his mother was, re they refused to let her be buried in the churchyard. You know, she was too scandalous a woman. And so like just those things, like who gets, you know, <laughs> who gets, you know, planted where? It says so much about how people felt or how, um, how much they trivialized somebody who was of a different class. Yeah, and who was valued and who wasn't and, and what was it dependent on and uh, what went missing as a result. And uh, so, so that, that um, allowed me to, I think, sympathetically, as much as I could try to reimagine what it must have been like for people of a different background who, for whom starving was just one of perhaps a string of events in their lives that they had to overcome, and not just one of the first. Right, and that makes so much sense because again, you look at that sort of class thing of people coming from England, or they're on these ships, they come there in all kinds of haphazard and different ways. And your, your heroine, Temperance, uh, <clears throat> it's almost like a fit of peak or something. You know, she, she decides right. she's going to go. And, and it's like right. a clueless thing that people do. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> this much thought, um, uh, you know, as her mother, you know, her family would say. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's kind of interesting, too, the sort of haphazardness of it, the, um, the way in which people take risks without thinking about them. And of course, she's been eating well her whole life. Right, right. Yeah, uh, um, even though there, there is something to be admired in, in spite of that, uh, the fact that she would take that risk at all. I mean, what would, what would compel someone of, of uh, gentility to take that kind of leap, um, uh, other than perhaps a, a fit of pique, as you say, uh, Certainly, um, there was a love of adventure. Uh, she was a thrill seeker. Um, there was there was a spirit in her that just propelled her to do these things that most people would would not. Right, and in a way, there is a parallel with that today. Even so, right? I mean, the idea of the person who practices you know it's not quite a parallel, but extreme sports or you know the kinds of adventures that a lot of people will undertake, and everyone else will go, "What in the world are you thinking?" You know, the explorers of the Arctic and all that. Yeah, I mean, where did Harriet Tubman come from? I mean, it's it's like, uh, you know, uh, this amazing human being, by the way, I just started reading the Tubman uh, com um, Command, so fascinating. But I mean, where did she come from? And uh, there were, the situation which she was in was, was so prohibitive in terms of escaping, let alone doing everything else she did. And so you just try to capture the essence of that spirit, that kind of human being that could take those risks. Yeah, and I, and I think it sort of like goes back to your painting um, close attention to certain details, like, you know, where the body was buried, you know, what was the age of the person who was buried, what was the condition of the skeleton, those sorts of things. For me, one of the things about Harriet Tubman is just, I didn't know before I started working on it was, oh, she's one of nine children and she's in the hmm. middle, you know, and so it, so what makes this middle child very yeah. different is not the oldest child, is not the youngest adventure child. No, it's just this child plunk in the middle of her family. She has four brothers, she has four sisters. She's the only one, you know, who says, I'm gonna get out of here and gets herself out. So, you know, some people are just uh, just born with some extraordinary spirit. It, it, spirit. People like Temperance Flower do. I mean, I think that you really, you bring that out, although it's it is so amusing. Where, unlike someone like Harriet Tubman, you, where you just know <clears throat> she has to be powerfully motivated to take the extreme risks that she does, physical risks. Tempers flower to you, 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 you almost feel like you know she kind of happens into it, and mm -hmm. uh, not quite an accidental adventure. Um, do you think that she, I mean, is that what gave you the sense that that was how it happened, how it came down for her? Um. Uh, I think just the fact that she made the decision to go, uh, and that she was so young, and I think that combination of, of youth and bravado and perhaps feeling stuck in her middle class 
situation. Um, just she was just hardwired to to take that kind of risk. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of like it's almost like the you know seven brides for seven brothers is super old <laughs> movie which no one's going to remember but <laughs> you know this idea of these are women who are going over because they know that they're going to they're going to meet men they're going to get married they're going to be part of the seed stock so to speak for this colony and that's kind of an interesting you know amazing thing that a person would say okay i'm just i'm going to do that you know that's um right that's right quite some but she ends up becoming kind of a high lady in a way i mean she'll, that was really, she really. She survives the story. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that, but that's a, I think encourages people to go on. Um, well, I, I, you know, uh, one other question I had was, you know, like you, I'm, you know, you're a fellow academic. Although it sounds like you're not teaching now. I'm but not. You, you've written, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> I love teaching, but you know, it gets tiring sometimes. Um, but I thought it was so interesting that you've done all this kinds of writing, right? You know, poetry mm -hmm. and books, nonfiction, you know, studying for a PhD. Was it hard? I mean, for you, what's the difference between writing uh, that kind of serious academic schlock? It's not schlock, but I mean, you know, <laughs> it's different. It's very different. I've written that kind of book too. I mean, where you're, it's you know, careful footnoting and it's just, you've got to have the authority. Uh, uh, authority, authority of you know your facts and all of that, and this is like just kind of a walk on the wild side. How did you? How you? How have you done that? How have you combined these different voices in in your own head? Um, I think that um, I thought I had to do the academic writing as a function of my career and uh, in my profession, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, and it was intellectually rigorous and very disciplined, as you say. Um, but I had started um, as an undergraduate writing fiction, but I kind of left that behind. And so there was this long period of my prefer, uh, profession as a professor in which I just did the kind of writing that um, enhanced my ability to teach. Uh, and then eventually at some point, I just wanted to return to that, I don't know, I guess the other sphere of my brain where I could indulge the my imagination and creativity in a way that was, you know, fundamentally different, I think, from some of the academic writing. Though in academic writing, that is creative. Yeah, you have to make creative decisions at the level of the, the word in the sentence. So there, it's not that academic writing is not creative. Um, and it, it does involve uh, some imagination uh, in terms of, for example, trying to understand uh, what Toni Morrison is doing in Beloved. I, I have to try to imagine what was in her head, which uh, is thought. Um, but there is such a difference between looking at someone else's work and studying it or looking at an historical period, I guess, in your case, and trying to convey uh or to reproduce or narrate what it was as opposed to inserting yourself into the historical period or creating your own characters uh so that you have um you have created something that is truly your own and i think i wanted the freedom to be able to do that so i wasn't tied to a, another text or i wasn't tied to an event I was just able to sit down and just let my imagination take over, even though fiction is also a function of discipline and rigor and uh, uh, steadfastness. Um, but um, I think it was just just allowing myself a different kind of freedom to do that. Do you feel ever like you kind of time travel a little bit? I mean, do you get kind of lost in your imagination? <laughs> <laughs> You're sort of like being temperance, you know, flower dude. Is it, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes the, the it'll, it'll be lunchtime and I won't know it be, until the cat jumps on my shoulder to let me know. And uh, I'll, I'll be back in my room looking out at my yard. And uh, that's that's really a fabulous um, experience uh, because 
as I've said earlier, you can't go back into history unless I think you try to imagine it. And so you can be Temperance, you can be Harriet Tubman, you can be Alexander Hamilton, you can be whoever you want, wherever you want. And whether it's accurate or not, well, or whether it's true, well, it's true for you in the moment that you're creating it. Mm -hmm. And yet there's that thing, the, the challenge of not being anachronistic, right? I mean, that by anachronistic, I mean sort of, <clears throat> you know, making up things that wouldn't actually fit, right? Either because they're not true to the time period or they're not true to what we know of a person, right? I mean, right. and so that's that, that discipline, right? That's the restraint that you have to exercise. And some writers don't think you have to, by the way. I mean, there are certainly uh, books where people make up lots of stuff, you know, and, <laughs> But um, I don't know why I, I always sort of resist that. I think uh, partly because I'm a historian and you know I want people to respect you in the morning kind of thing. But uh, it also always seems to me like people are such miracles already, you know. And um, <laughs> we don't have to make up extra stuff. We we have to figure out how they did it. Kind of it's like like the mystery of Harriet Tubman's bravery, you know. Uh, you know, it's it's something to think about, or the mystery of the, the bravery of these two women. Because you have two characters. Would you want to talk a little bit about their relationship, the character between Temperance and, and you have this other character named Lily who right. comes with her. Right. And, um, and that's interesting because it's so often uh, books are about the relationships that a woman might have with a man. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's really about their kind of almost teamwork. Right. Yeah, and there's a real class difference. Lily is uh, Temperance's servant, um, but because both of them are so young and the adventure is so outside the norms of their experience that that class structure collapses. And I start, they start to become friends and companions in ways that might not have happened had they stayed in England. Uh, and so when that happens, every talent and the ability that these women have is utilized as opposed to kind of deep sixed because of class, race, uh, gender. Uh, and so Lily becomes the one who keeps them alive, whereas Temperance is able to utilize her intellect uh, in devious ways to circumvent some of the dangerous decisions that some of the men make. Uh, but together they can combine their talents without any uh, fear of temperance losing her authority or her position in society. It doesn't matter at this point, they're starving. Uh, and so they're, they're at that moment when everything is on the line, all of those other accoutrements of life that are so divisive no longer matter. All that matters is they're going to keep each other alive at any cost. Yeah, no, I think uh, you described that very well. And that really, it really comes across <coughs> in the book. In some ways, you know, it reminds me a bit of the characters in Cold Mountain by Charles Frazier. Uh, yeah. Remember where... Um, yep. Read, it sounds like you read it too. So, and of course, Nicole Kidman played the, <laughs> the fragile flower in the movie version, but um, the, uh, it is this sort of interesting thing of people in extremis, right? And suddenly it's just their humanity. And in a way, I, I like what you just said because their class backgrounds give them different tools. It's not like the person who's upper class has no tools, it's just very different tools than, right. the, than the young woman who's used to scraping and just surviving. And so it's that kind of interesting play of the different sides of, that, of the human heart and human skills. But I also felt that very much was at one point where you were talking about um, that they were all in church. I'm trying to remember which page it was on, but they're all in church and she's not normally that, you know, normally she'd be bored, you know, like, oh, when's this gonna be over? And then she realizes, oh my God, we're still all here. We're still all chanting, we're still all singing. And so this, this thing that you wouldn't maybe even appreciate, you know, these small things and how the, the small things that make us human become so big. You know, I, I think that that's, 
that's an interesting part of it. Maybe that's part of your sort of uh, sleepwalking back into the past and thinking, what would it be like <laughs> you know, if I had no food left? Now, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting, you are also balancing as, you know, briefly the characters of the Native Americans who are outside the fort, right? Who have them under siege at times. Uh, how did you go about imagining those characters? That started in the literature too. Uh, when I taught early American literature, I started with the Native Americans because as I told my students, they were here first. So that's that's pretty much what I had to go by was the uh, how much of the oral history and oral tradition of Native Americans had been captured enough so that I could read it uh, and try to understand as much as I could, I read as much as I could, uh, and not just of the Powhatans, but many different Native American tribes to get a sense of uh, what it must have been like uh, to be indigenous on this continent before the Europeans came. Uh, and um, I would have to say that that was daunting um, in ways that reimagining Lily and Temperance, for example, were not. And I just, um, tried to be as honest and respectful of, of the Native Americans as I possibly could, but, but not to the point of being patronizing so that they didn't come across as real characters, as human beings. Right, well, and there's that thing too, that they, these people are mortal enemies of each other. And of course, we've been rooting for our temperance, uh, you know, to make it and our friend Lily to make it. And, uh, maybe a couple of these creeps they come in to <laughs> the, the jerky guys uh, some wonderful men too um but it's an interesting thing right you know because you need to show they don't really look upon these settlers as fellow human beings any more than the settlers really look upon them as fellow human beings and so you have to you have to cope as a writer with as you said making them realistic yeah and uh what would it have been like to have been uh, and a member uh, of an indigenous tribe to know that this that this uh, invasion was occurring, that your way of life was uh, hanging by a thread. What would that have been like? Uh, so that that was um, that was that was very fulfilling in a different way because um, it forced me to go outside more so my comfort zone and and try to recreate that experience as faithfully as I could. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I just want to say, I think, you know, as a historian, <laughs> putting on my other hat now, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that uh, I just really like that. Now, but I thought you did a really good job, though. Again, Denise, I'll say, if you don't hit it on the nose, you know, that sort of act term in amongst uh, filmmakers where the script is like, well, you remember when your mother and I uh, had you at age blah, blah, you know, where people are telling each other things that the reader knows they people don't say in real life. I mean, you managed to do that to get in those really interesting historical details about, you know, the water and the, and then the food and, the, you know, all these various things about, um, about the, the expeditions themselves and who comes over when and, you know, where does Pocahontas fit in? You, you tuck those things in very deftly. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So speaking of writing, is there any particular thing like when you step back from you go, I really like what I did in this paragraph or that paragraph? <laughs> Are there any favorite sentences, favorite characters? I couldn't wait to write the scene where I was going up the James. Well, yeah, here I was going up the James River. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Uh, where the Earth Falcon. To Denise, Earth to Denise. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, writing the scene where the, the uh, settlers were going up the James River and they were going to see Jamestown for the first time. Because, oh my goodness, that must have been such a sight. So I couldn't wait to write that scene. And um, I had to go to the James River. I, I you know, had to canoe on it a little bit and look at the flora and fauna and, and all of that. Um, and I mean, there's nothing that can prepare you for what that must have been like. That's the best I could do. But that was really fun. And also when James Owen picks up the fiddle and um, the settlers have been starving and it's been horrible, and then they start to dance. And that's when I imagine how the Virginia reel is born. 
from the English country dance to the Virginia reel. That was really gratifying to write that, I have to say. Yeah, that, uh, that makes so much sense. Well, because that's that thing as a writer, how you're trying to draw on all the senses, right? You know, trying to draw on the sense of smell and the sense of feel and the sound and music and all those kinds of things that give, uh, you know, make something come alive. Well, I think that where it might be, uh, I'm supposed to let Amanda back in the room. Amanda, <laughs> are you here? <laughs> well, questions from other people. Well, I want to urge anyone on Facebook to go and go ahead and put your questions in the comments should you choose to accept that invitation. Um, otherwise, you're just going to hear me plying these ladies with questions. Um, so, I was curious, you almost, you skirted around it, uh, Denise, but I'm wondering the idea for the book, the idea for writing Temperance's story, um, did it come, did it come like a bolt of lightning where you knew you were going to be writing her or did it come on sort of gradually for you? Uh, kind of both. Um, when, after I watched the documentary, I, I you know, ran to Google and I searched everything I could for everything I could find. And I ran into Temperance and I'm like, uh oh, this is interesting. And then the article was like the bolt of lightning after the clouds and the thunder started. Then it was bam, I know it, this is it. And it doesn't happen very often. But so that's when you know that that's the moment. Yeah, and then I couldn't wait. Um, so I mentioned your, your biography, you are a descendant of Louisa May Alcott. I am. So that's quite the lineage. Uh, did, what, what, was, what was that like when uh, informing, was it, was it a factor in your writer's journey? Did it influence your interests? Well, I have uh, seven brothers and sisters, and I have five sisters. And we knew from a very young age that uh, Louisa May Alcott was in our, our family lineage. And so that was always kind of there. Um, and of course, we all read Little Women and Little Men, watched every iteration, every remake of Little Women. Um, so it was she was always there. Uh, though I, I don't think I consciously said I'm going to be a writer because of Louise May Elcott. It was just this kind of cool fact uh, that you could sort of nurse on occasion um, that, that made me feel pretty good. Um, but certainly as I get older, I feel an increasingly greater connection to her, I think, on, on certain levels. Do you have a favorite adaptation? Um, probably the one with June Allison, though June Allison looks like she's 30 years old playing Joe, but that's. <laughs> How much, when was that even made? I mean, June Allison is like, we're going back to what, to the 50s? The 50s, yeah. I mean, the Catherine Hepburn one was before that, I think. And yeah, there's been some really good ones. I just saw the most recent one uh, by uh, that Greta Gerwig produced. I thought that was fabulous. Yeah. You know, I think that one of the things interesting about Louise May Alcott is just that idea that she's one of the first authors to try to make children real characters, you know, to show that they're mm -hmm. like real people. They're not, you know, I don't know. They, they, they have whole souls and whole imaginations and big conflicts with each other. and all that I mean she's such a, a different writer in that respect you know really but I, I was reminded her in fact when we were talking a little bit earlier and you're sort of in your mind you know you're becoming this and then you're and then you're that person and then you're going up and I, I'm remembering those seeds early in Little Women there were they're all in the attic and they're switching hats and putting on different roles and faces and clothing and playing dress up <laughs> yeah um the writer reminded me of that hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I keep staring at the, the stack of books behind Elizabeth. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask both of you, what, what are you reading right now, either for fun or for edification? I'll let Denise go first. Well, let's see. I just finished, well, it's been a while, actually. I read The Gentleman in Moscow, 
Uh, I read that very slowly and methodically. I reread Moby Dick very slowly and methodically. Uh, recently, uh, um, I'll kick it back to you, Elizabeth, while I try to recall titles. <laughs> I, I'm, I, uh, I write fiction and nonfiction. I kind of go back and forth between those. I, I love to read fiction, why it was so fun to get a chance to read um, you know, Temperance Flowerdew. Um, but right now I'm working on a nonfiction book on the history of women's rights in America from Abigail Adams to Beyonce. Ooh. So I, <laughs> I'm wow. on the Beyonce, I know. I'm on the <laughs> Beyonce chapter. So I've actually written seven out of the eight chapters, and this is the last chapter I'm, I'm working on it right now. So <clears throat> I'm reading stuff about Beyonce and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff uh, at the moment. Oh yeah, okay. I'm serious. Like, because you don't even see all the books I got stacked up. I have Soul Survivor with Destiny's <laughs> Child. So I can't claim to be reading Moby Dick, you know. I'm all, more power to you there, Denise. But it's very interesting, you know, I'm, ha I'm having a lot of fun with it. So I get in that phase where I'm finishing a project and my whole office is exploded. And uh, I just may, I'm trying to make it look kind of good sitting behind me, but you know, you don't want to see what's much farther around my feet. <laughs> so all different kinds of stuff. But that's, you say slowly and methodically, Denise, is that come from your being a literature professor? Do you think you, I mean, I think when I read fiction, I'm just like, yeah hell bent for leather or whatever the old cliche is but it sounds like you like kind of like look at everything well I, i'd like to mix it up i mean i'm also reading the death of jane lawrence which is a really kind of a it's a horror thriller which is really fun and that i read quickly moby dick is just dense and um amor tolis i hope i pronounced that correctly uh his prose is just uh this the kind of prose that you you i think you just have to read very slowly to appreciate um, but I like to read all kinds of different things. And, and I also get the New York Times Sunday paper, which takes me all week to read. All week. <laughs> How about you, Amanda? What are you reading now? What was, what's been some of your favorite stuff? Oh, man. Well, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did you love. A minute, uh, we can like pretend, you know, while you're thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I'm thinking about it because you mentioned it in the green room. I, I mean, when talking about things that I loved recently, I loved Anthony Doerr's new book, uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land. Um, it's, we, uh, this week we're sending out a list um, of all of our favorite books for holiday gifting from Warwick's employees. And I'm, I'm in between that one and a nonfiction book called Fox and I, which is uh, the subtitle is An Uncommon Friendship and it's by a, a biologist named Catherine Raven who sort of accidentally befriends a fox and it has to grapple with it because she wants to avoid that mortal sin of um, anthropomorphizing an animal. Um, but uh, she also sort of examines that friendship through the lens of literature. So it's it's just a wonderful book for book lovers. And um, so many good books, so many good books. Um, so wait, I, I know I had, let's see, let's check the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, excuse me, just, just an anecdote. Uh, I, yes. had, I had a professor once who said that she had calculated based on how many books she could read in a year, she um, had calculated how many books she would be able to read before she died at the average uh, age of 75 or whatever the lifespan is. So I remember that vividly. That was kind of daunting. I try not to think about it because I think <laughs> I'm already at capacity <laughs> and I don't want to think about it. <laughs> a little morbid too. First of all, deciding on what the yeah. actuarial tables say about you. <laughs> I think, I think I just want to like kind of like float along and not really know that kind yeah, of thing. True. <laughs> the, and then thinking out. about Moby Dick, like you, uh, I, I took a class at UCSD where we spent a whole class talking about one of his sentences. And oh my goodness. Yeah, the, the, his syntax is wild. Right, right. Uh, and like, I would love to be one of those voracious readers, but 
at the same time, I also love delving into just a single sentence. So. <laughs> you remember the sentence? That's an interesting I think question. Go, go. That's an interesting question as a writer, uh, Denise. I found that your prose, I mean, just, you know, lickety split, you know, I'm reading it, I'm not stumbling over, I'm not coming out of the story over it. And yet um, often there's this sort of attitude towards historical fiction. Well, like, is it real literature? Cause you know, first of all, it's just easy to read. And I, I, I don't know, what do you think about that whole thing? That whole question, do you sometimes go, oh, I need to make this a little more complicated so people will take me seriously? Or are you just all about, let me make it transparent? I just want the language to try to capture what's going on. I, I don't think about um, moving the plot along. I, I just, uh, it, you know, if um, Lily's trying to scrounge up some food so they can survive, how do you convey that beyond just the basic facts of what she's doing? How the, the emotional, psychological, spiritual uh, makeup of that moment. So the language, that's when I use the language to try to convey that. I mean, Beloved by Toni Morrison is historical fiction, and uh, that is language that makes you pause and reflect and, and um, Jenna flocked, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Uh, we heard what Elizabeth is working on, and, you know, apologies, Denise, because, you know, you're, you're still writing this book coming out, especially during the pandemic. So it's been, you know, it, it must still feel fresh, even though it's been a little bit, but what are you working on next? Um, I am working on a novel about grandmothers and it's, I'm hoping it's a thriller if that isn't, you know, oxymoronic. Uh, grandmothers, I think are highly undervalued uh -huh. in, our, in, in our culture uh, and, uh, I mean, they're, they're valued and cherished and worshiped in many ways, but um, I want to portray them in ways that they are traditionally not valued and honored and worshiped. Uh, and so therefore the thriller. Cool. Are you talking about bank <laughs> robbers or? <laughs> uh, they form a society that uh, is uh, subversive to some extent and that's all I'll say. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow cool yeah well, thank you for asking I'm, I'm excited good you know it's funny how authors are like that sometimes authors are very suspicious I mean superstitious almost they don't want to say one word I actually I saw Immortals give a talk once the gentleman from Moscow and, and then someone's asked you know so what are you working on now and he went you know, you could just sort of get the blinds come down, the shutters go across. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't talk about that. You're like, well, what? <laughs> yeah, I, somebody, some uh, I heard an author say once that you talk about it too much, you'll talk, you'll talk your idea to death. So I, that stuck with me. That's interesting. Yeah. I was kind of a journalist a little bit before I was mm. an academic. So I always just have this like fear of being like scooped, you know, like. You know, if you talk about something, somebody else will come along and do it. So just be quiet. <laughs> Relate to that. It's kind of like revealing your, your wedding gown <laughs> before, <laughs> before the ceremony. Yeah. Very exciting. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Um, there's it's a momentous day here in San Diego because actual weather is happening it's <laughs> it's raining so I wish everyone out there wonderful reading this is the perfect reading weather again you can get Denise's book through Warwick's the link is in our comment section and please do join us for more events and hopefully we'll be hosting both of you for your next project maybe, maybe. in person Oh, that'd be wonderful. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, thank you both. We'll sign off for the night. And uh, again, thank you so, so much. Both thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Elizabeth. Conversation. Take care.